you go ahead and be seated. Was that time of great time of praise and worship or what? Amen. Give the Lord a hand for that. Wow. Mm. Folks, that's some good stuff. Hey, it's time for our kids to head on up to Children's Church. So anyone up to the sixth grade, uh, if you'll come on down. Uh, ladies, all of you can come. Yeah, there you go. All right. It's good to see everybody coming down. Look at this group. Thank you for bringing the kids to church. Amen. All right. Today, we're going to be talking about convenient service. Convenient service. So if you would, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. Amen. 1 Chronicles chapter 21, looking, starting at verse 21. Over this whole year, I've been sharing with you the, the, the theme has been uh, to connect and serve in 2021. And we have talked about connecting, connecting to God, connecting to the church, connecting to people. And now we're looking at how we take all of those connections, and now we're talking about serving. Last week, we defined what the serving was and what it was all about. Today, what we're going to be looking at, though, is, is convenient serving. Serving only when it's convenient, only when there's, there's nothing else going on. And we all like to think about serving, but if I'll be honest with you, all too often, if we're being totally honest, we really like to serve Jesus and other people when we were planning on it, when I had time to think about it and I've set myself forward and now I'm ready. It's that, it's that time when it just happens. It's when I wasn't ready, when I wasn't prepared, when it actually is going to cost me and, and make some inconveniences in my life. Now we're kind of struggle with that because quite frankly, I believe at times we in America, we struggle with inconvenience, amen? Because we love conveniences. We love having, we pay a lot of money for conveniences. We have conveniences all around us. Hey folks, we're even having convenience in here today, amen? Don't you just love the air conditioning? Woo! Praise the Lord for air conditioning. Don't you love the soft chairs? Don't you at home love just being able to be on your couch? Folks, that's convenient. As a matter of fact, again, we love conveniences. We look around us, and, and even with our electronics, we have, uh, we have conveniences. We have our remote controls. Every house has remote controls, amen, so that we can change the channels. We can turn on this, turn off that. And we, as a matter of fact, it's even gotten to where now, I don't have one, but I know they exist, is that you can take your remote and speak into it. You don't even have to push a button, amen? Now, that's convenience. Now, I want to tell y'all something. That's nothing new. My dad had, one, had six of those back when I was growing up. My dad, I don't recall in my whole childhood my dad ever having to change a channel. He had six remote controls, and he could speak, and they would change, amen? For example, he'd say, Harold, go change the channel, Amen? And if Harold wasn't around, that's okay. He could go down the line. He'd say, Darlene, go change that channel. Darlene would get up and change the channel. Darlene wasn't there. Hey, so what? Darlene and Harold not here. Jimmy, go change the channel. Jimmy wasn't around. That's all right. Hey, Gene, go change the channel. Gene wasn't around. He could still go on down. Robbie, go change the channel. If Robbie wasn't there, he could still even go Norma change the channel. I was beginning to think all those times, that's the only reason my dad had so many kids, was that he never would have to change the channel. Amen? So we were always there. Praise God. I know this blows some of you young people's minds, but praise God, there were only three channels. Amen? <laughs> Could you imagine today trying to find your dad something to watch on television? Wow. Like we don't even do that anymore. Y'all, you older people knew what I was doing, right? You knew that. <laughs> Younger people are going, what's that? <laughs> That's that channel changer. You clicked around. You didn't push a button, amen? So we had that. So we have those conveniences. We, we, have, our, we have our phones, and phones are convenient now. Sometimes my, my family gets upset at me because I, I love losing that convenience sometimes, Amen. Do y'all remember when the phones weren't even convenient? Do you remember that when they were not in your pocket, they were either on the wall or on a table? And do you remember when someone called to find out who it was? Did you remember what you had to do? 
You had to answer it. Amen? You actually had to answer it. And, and, and so you, if you really wanted to know, now you, could, you don't even have to answer the phone anymore. As a matter of fact, most people don't take that convenience. Amen? They don't answer the phone. We have the thing called voicemail. That way we pick or choose. If it's somebody we don't know, we don't answer it. We let them get to the voicemail. Then if we decide that we want to call them back. You didn't have that before. Remember that? And how many of y'all remember... Not only did we have to answer the phone, but there was a time that when the phone rang, everybody ran fast to see who was going to answer the phone. Do y'all remember that? I got it. No, I got it. It's my turn. We got to answer the phone. All the dad's remote controls were running to the phone, man. But so we have these conveniences that we really like. We have packaged foods. Meals are convenient now. You don't even have to make them. They're already there. They delivered to you. You don't have to go shopping anymore. They're delivered to your door. Folks, we love conveniences. Amen? We think about it all the time. How about our, our television, even streaming? Do you remember in the old days when you watched a show, and at the end of the show there was a little cliffhanger for the week? Do you remember what you'd have to do to find out what was happening next? You had to wait the whole week until the next week that it came on. And boy, if it was good, you didn't want to miss it. Because you're going to have to wait until the summer when the reruns came on. (laughs) Now we can sit down and we don't even need a commercial anymore. Amen? As a matter of fact, a while back, my wife and I were watching one of the channels. And we were watching something and it went for a break. We thought, oh, it's about to click back on. They had a commercial. (laughs) I hate to admit it, but I found myself getting aggravated. Amen? A commercial? What is that? Well, that's for us cheap people who don't want to pay the special price to get more. It's worth the commercial. Amen? But what I'm trying to make here is that we love our convenience. We pay for convenience. We desire, we long for it. And if we're not careful, it might even come into our church. If it's not careful, it might come into our mindset of service that we talked about last week. I want you to take your Bibles and look in 1 Chronicles chapter 21. We're going to be looking at verse 21 through 24. David, King David, is about to give us, I believe, man, and I've read this many times, but a while back God was placing all these messages and directions on my heart for the, the sermons. And I read this one, and I mean, it just jumped out at me like never before of what David's response was about the idea of service. And I thought, man, this is what I need, and this is what I believe we need. But let's go ahead and stand if you're able to. First Chronicles chapter 21, starting at verse 21. We're going to be reading about David and how David is going to be making a sacrifice to God. The Bible says, so David came to Ornan, and Ornan looked and saw David, and he went out from the threshing floor and bowed before David with his face to the ground. Then David said to Ornan, Grant me, this, grant me the place of this threshing floor, that I may build an altar on it for the Lord. You shall grant it to me at the full price that this plague may be withdrawn from the people. But Ornan said to David, Take it to yourself, and let my lord the king do what is good in his eyes. Look, I also will give you the oxen for burnt offerings, the threshing implements for wood, and, and the wheat for the grain offering. I give it all. Now listen to what David said. Then King David said to Ornan, No, but I will surely buy it for the full price. For I will not take what is yours for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings with that which cost me nothing. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for the great time of praise and worship. And I pray, God, that that same spirit was there will now settle into this place as, the, as your word is now going to be shared. Father, I pray that the words I'm about to say will be my word, your words and not mine. I pray that this will be your message that you've given me, not one that I just came up with. And I pray, Father, that the response will be as you want it from your people. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Convenience. Convenient service. This is what we're looking at today. And this is what God, I believe, wants us to understand about our service. What I want to do is I want to look back at a couple of things about this text. First of all, what we see here from David is David's understanding of what service meant. 
David got a hold of this. David understood what this was all about. And so when it was offered to him, you can take this. I, will, I or none said, will give you everything that's necessary. I will give you this place. I will give you the material. I will give you every piece of the offering that you can make to God. David understood when he said, I will not ask you to give anything, nor will my sacrifice be anything that did not cost me something. So it was his idea because David understood something. The first thing David understood is he had sinned against God. Now, if you don't know what was going on, if you'll read back into the uh, previous chapters here, you find out that King David basically had been given a promise of God that everything that he touches will be good. David will be a conqueror. David will take over and God will bless him. God, God will prosper him. Well, David, it had started happening in David's life just as God had said. But what happened was David began to place his faith in the world and not God. So here's what he did. He got to looking around and he said, you know what? I need to know that I got all that I need to be a victor. I, got, I need to know that we're not going to get taken over. Even though God had promised him, David, if you'll follow me, I will take care of all that. The Bible says that David said, I want you to go to his commander. said, I want you to go and I want you to do a census. I want you to find out how many people we have that are ready to fight the battle. I want to trust. I want to know that when, if the enemy comes, I will be ready. I want to know when the enemy comes, I will have everything that's necessary to win. So you say, well, what was such a big deal with that? Well, again, God had already promised him, said, David, do not trust in you. Do not trust in your might. Do not trust in all the stuff that you have. Trust me and know that I'm going to do what I told you I would do. Well, David began to either out of pride to flaunt it off or out of fear to make sure that he was secure. And so I began to think about sometimes that God has promised us that he will meet all of our needs according to, to his glory in Christ Jesus. But yet sometimes I look around and, man, I feel like I can serve God if I look and I have at the end of the month, I have a little bit left over in my finances. Sometimes I can feel like I can serve God better if I look around and all my family's feeling well and they're, they're not suffering. And I look around and I, I begin to think my service is dependent upon everything of the world fitting the way I want it to be. When God has promised me that all he wants me to do is serve him and he will take care of everything else. We shared last week, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. First thing we do as his people is we seek him out first. We don't look at the world situation. Amen? Because I'm telling you, if we began to look at the world situation right now, we'd want to throw our hands up in the air and say, boy, we can't do anything. Just imagine if we were over in one of those other countries and they were suffering like that. I bet you those people sometimes want to throw their hands in the air and say, boy, I give up. Because everything isn't just right. David understood that he had sinned against God and that also that God then was also a merciful God. God had shown him mercy. He said, David, I, I, will, I will come to you and here's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to allow you to choose which way you, form of punishment that I give you. David said, well, I've got a choice. I can either start, put my hands in God or I can put my life in, into the hands of the world. And he said, man, I choose God. God's merciful to me. And God began to show mercy on David. Now, listen, the nation of Israel had to, had to suffer because of David's choices. Because what David did, the nation of Israel suffered some, but God showed his mercy to him. And he knew what God had done for him. And that's why he said, I understand that I I sinned. I understand that it is I who should pay the cost. But I know then that God has been merciful to me. And I understand that. So I know that God has been good to me. And so he had sinned. And now God has shown his mercy. And he knew what God had done for him. And then he realized the third thing was that his service was his sacrifice. That if it wasn't his sacrifice, then it wouldn't be his service. It would be Ornan's sacrifice. So who was actually serving God in the sacrifice? It wouldn't have been David. 
So there's so many times that, that we in the church, if we're not careful, the church is going and, and church, God is leading the church into certain things. And so many times if we're not careful in the church, we want to go along for the ride. We like where the church is going. We like what the church is doing. We like what God is and how he's showing his power through the church. But we just kind of like to go along for the ride. David said, look, I don't want to go along for the ride, or none." He said, you, God, have been good to me. You have shown mercy to me. It is my fault that Israel is suffering. So why would I want to come along for the ride? Why would I let someone else do what I need to do? My friends, listen to me. That's what we need to do with this idea of convenient service is realize God has been good to us. Amen? And that God has been good to me, and what God is doing is God saying, I want you, Harold, to serve me. And I should not say, well, God, I will serve you as long as everybody else is doing their stuff. I will serve you, God, as long as everybody else does it for me. So David understood what God has done for him. My friends, can I tell you today, one thing we need to do is we need to get back to understanding what God has done for us. Amen? Amen? God, listen to me. God has been good to you. Let me say that again. God has been good to you. Look where you are today. You're in the, you're in a wonder, the most powerful free country that's ever been in existence of the world. Look where other Christians are today. You're not hiding out in a cave hoping that somebody doesn't have your name written down on a card trying to find you for being a Christian. You've got air conditioning. We got lighting. We got good sound. We had great music. We got padded chairs. God has been good to us. He's been very good. David understood it. And if we could understand it, we would not worry. Listen to me. We would not worry so much about our convenience. We would understand it's going to cost something. As a matter of fact, Rick Warren said this. Jesus wants us to count the cost of our commitment. He wants us to understand the, count, the cost. Because he knows it will demand everything we have. In essence, Jesus warns us away from a romantic view of following him. Of thinking, well, we're blessed, we're easy, it's going to be good, I'll follow Jesus wherever you go. Because so often we sing the song, I surrender all, wherever he leads I'll go. We sing it, we love it, we love getting out there. When all the time we're thinking, well, I'm really not going to go wherever he leads. So Rick Warren says that we need to understand that when we volunteer to go anywhere at any time, our romanticism will wither when our commitment becomes inconvenient. Or when it collides with the full cost of discipleship because we have this idea if we're not careful we can have the idea that my my service ought to be convenient when I want to how I want to where I want to and to what degree I want to serve and David said to Ornan I will not give anything that I didn't give the cost for I don't want to come along for the ride, Ornan. I want to serve. My sacrifice, that's my service. And that's why he tells us, present your bodies a what? Living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is your what? Reasonable act of service. Your sacrifice, listen, your sacrifice is your service. A lack of sacrifice, lack of service. So that's what David, man, that's what he got in his mind. That's, and folks, listen, that the time I was reading this and God said, this is the message you to have, that jumped out at me and I said, oh God, please let me not be that. Let me be like David. I, I want to give because I know you've been so good to me. Let my sacrifice be your service. And so what I want to wrap up here very quickly is I want the second part of this sermon is the church must work to maintain this mindset. We've got to work hard at the church, especially in America, especially in modern America today. We've got to work hard to keep David's mindset. Amen? Because I want you to know something. We live in a time of spiritual consumerism. 
Now you say, well, okay, well, now what is that? Well, let, as I shared in the first service, I'm going to give you a, a very brief, very basic 101 uh, idea of, of economics, that we live in a consumer nation, amen? We used to be a producing nation, but now we've changed and we're in a consumer nation. Do you understand that's why everybody tells you get those credit cards, go in debt, spend, 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 because the more you spend, the better our nation is, because again, we are a consumer nation, not a producing nation. Now, what does that mean, though? Very quickly. It means that we consume rather than produce, that we consume the stuff rather than producing the stuff. We don't make it anymore. We, 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 we take it. We devour it. But also that is that because of the consumer mindset, we would rather be served rather than serving. I want to go places to make it convenient. I want to go where people are waiting on me and they take care of me. That's the consumer mentality. Because if I'm going to pay for it, guess what? I want you to take care of me. It's also receiving rather than giving. So we receive stuff rather than giving it out. We would rather be takers. Give to me, give to me, give to me, rather than, hey, what can I do for you? And the last part of consumerism is the idea that the customer is always right. If you've ever worked in retail, and I did in college, one of the hardest things for me to grasp was the customer was always right no matter what. And man, I knew beyond a doubt that customer wasn't right. I knew I was right. But you know what the goal was? To get that customer back in the store. And so what we had to do was, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, whatever you say, I will, yes, just as long as you come back. That is consumerism. That's what that means. Now, we know that is prominent in America today. Again, we are a consuming nation. But the problem is that mentality if we're not careful, we'll come into the church. And that's where we idea of spiritual consumerism. That we take that philosophy out there in the world and we bring it into the church and this is how we now conduct business of the church. So what does that mean? I've, I've got three things that, it, that, I, that I, I think that it looks at. First one is spiritual consumerism says, what does the church offer me not what I can add to the church. What is the church offering? What can they give me that makes me feel good, makes me where I want to be a part of it, rather than walking in and saying, you know, what can I add to the church? And this idea of consumerism is, again, if the church is able to meet my needs and do what I want them to do, then I'm going to be there. But the minute it doesn't happen, what do we do? We go somewhere else for what purpose? To serve and to add to the church? No, so that that church might be able then to meet the needs that I have. Because that's the consumeristic mentality. David said, I don't want to be that way. I don't ask or not what you can give me. I'm not asking what God can give me. I know what God has given me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give to him. The second one is desiring, is desiring emotional highs rather than true worship with conviction. It's where we come in and we want everything done focused on make me feel good. When I walk out of that service today, I want to walk two feet off the ground because I am the best me that I can be. You have told me how to be better. You have told me that things in my life are good. You have told me that my future is bright. You have told me that everything out there is just coming up rosy for me. And that it's all about me and I want to feel good rather than coming in here and being convicted. Now we have a story in the New Testament that Jesus told about this idea. And if you'll remember, the Bible says that Jesus told the story of two men that were sitting in a worship service. One of them stood up and said, boy, Lord, thank you that I'm not like someone else. Thank you that I'm good. Thank you that I am proud. Thank you that I am a gift to this place and I'm a gift to the world. Thank you, Lord, that I'm not like everybody else. I am so much better. I am being the best me that I can be. And God, thank you so much for it. 
He said, and thank you, especially that I'm not like that man. And he points out somebody. Y'all remember that story? But now listen, the same man that was over here that he was pointing at said, God, and he says that he beat on his chest, and he cried out and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I am not worthy to be here. I am not worthy to breathe. God, I know that I don't have anything apart from you. God, have mercy on me. And Jesus said at the end of that service, one of them walked away okay, one of them didn't. And you know which one it was that walked away okay? The one who worshiped with conviction. Folks, can I tell you, sometimes when we're in church and the Holy Spirit begins to breathe on us, the Holy Spirit begins to work in us, the Holy Spirit begins to guide us, can I tell you that's called conviction? And sometimes conviction don't make you walk out of here feeling good about yourself. Sometimes conviction makes you feel hurt, but it makes you realize that there is a God that loves you that gave his life for you. Someone that is looking for a spiritual high rather than a worship of conviction can come to church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, every special event and walk out of here and still, listen to me, and still be lost. Because it's not the song that makes you saved. It's not the joy you feel with the music. It's not the happiness that you feel when the preacher tells you you're all right. Life is good. Go out and live it. Enjoy life. Eat, drink, and be merry. Man, sometimes it's the realization that I desperately need God. I can't do this on my own. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. So we look and we see that when we desire emotional highs rather than true worship of conviction, that we're falling into the spiritual consumerism. And the last one is this, judging by personal preference, not scriptural principles. Judging what's going on in the church, around the church, through the church, about the church, off of my personal preference rather than what does scripture say? Folks, that goes on a lot in the church if we're not careful because we walk out of a service going, well, I didn't get anything out of that because I didn't like that song. I didn't get anything out of that because I didn't like that message. I didn't get anything out of that because that's not the way I would like it to have been. My question is, did you find something scripturally wrong with the song? If you did, boy, you have some grounds, amen? Amen. If you didn't have any, if you can't find scripturally something wrong with it, you don't have any grounds, man. If it worship, if it if it told the truth of God, what about the message? Maybe you didn't like the joke I told. Maybe you didn't like the stories I referred to. Maybe you don't think I should have done it that way. Should have said this. Should have said that. Listen, if there's something scripturally wrong with what I'm saying, then folks, you have every right to not be pleased with this message. But if you can't find something scripturally wrong with it. You're just judging off a preference. A consumer will take everything off of their preference rather than biblical principle. I shared this in church uh, in the first service as well, is that some of you, many of you were not here when we built that new building over there. And uh, many of you, all of you that were here realized that before we, before we voted to build that building and, and take that next step and to borrow the money and get things going, man, we, we took the church through a, a time a month of praying and fasting. Y'all remember that? Praying and fasting on Thursday morning, Thursday all day. Man, we're going to spend that every Thursday for a month praying and fasting on it. And I remember telling the church, I remember telling many of you, and I, I felt this as, I believed at the end of that time, I was not worried about dividing the church over the vote to build the building or not. Because I believe we had all been spoken of God to build that building, to take the steps. And he has blessed us since. Amen. So I told you my fear wasn't that. What my fear was is when we were going to start deciding the carpet. (laughs) Remember, I told you that. What my fear was is when we were going to decide the color of paint. What my fear was when we were to consider the countertops. What my fear was when we were going to consider the flooring. 
Every time we had to make a decision on that, I got a little worried because my friends, can I tell you, that's where Satan could have really gotten a foothold in there. Praise God he didn't. If you disagreed, you didn't voice it too much, and you're still here. If you're not here because of that, shame on you anyway. You should still be here. But you're not hearing it anyway, so it doesn't matter. Folks, can I tell you, most churches do not split over biblical principle. Most churches split or have problems over personal preference. A consumer will base everything off of what I like or dislike. If I don't like it, I'll voice my concern because guess what? The customer, the church member, is always right. (laughs) Just like all of y'all know that worked in retail, the customer wasn't always right. Can I tell you, sometimes some of the members aren't always right. But sometimes the pastor's not right. That's why we need the Holy Spirit of God guiding us together and unifying our spirit. So this is what spiritual consumerism is. So I want to wrap it up. My my, my time is already actually up, but I'm going going to take a few minutes anyway. What we have to do is, in order to to battle that, in order to keep the mindset that David had, in order to be able to to move forward and, and be where God wants us to be as a church, what we're going to have to do is realize what has been done for us. For us to stop just a moment right here, right now, and say, God, I need you to remind me, what have you done for me? You sent your son to, to die on the cross for me, a sinner who had no concern for God, who had no caring for him, but you, in that point, sent your son to die on the cross for this sinner. God has shown his rich mercy to us Through Jesus Christ. Amen. God, listen to me, I'm going to tell you again, God has been good to all of you. God has been good to you, and he's been good to me, and we need to pause for just a second and realize just how good he's been. If we can't remember that, we're going to have a hard time letting our sacrifice be our service. Oh, but he's been good to me. And can I tell you as I wrap this up, He did what only he could do. No one could have shown us the mercy that Jesus Christ did on the cross. No thing could have shown us and done for us what Jesus Christ did on the cross. It is his name and his name only that can bring salvation to us. It is his name and it is his name only that deserves to be praised in this worship service this morning. It is his name and his name only that's given above under heaven that all men can be saved. It is only at the name of Jesus, listen to me, it is only at the name of Jesus that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. Only he could do what he did. That's what we need to remember. And man, if we could remember that, we would be like David. And we would say, do not let any of my sacrifices be from someone else. Let it be only what I have. I will give nothing, God, to you. I will give nothing to you that didn't cost me something. Because I know what you did. And listen, can I tell you, and I'll wrap this up. He's not not asking you to do it so you can pay him back. David wasn't trying to pay God back. He couldn't pay him back. God didn't want you to pay him back because can I tell you this? None of us got enough to pay God back. He doesn't want us to pay it back. He wants us to honor him for it. He wants us to worship him for it. He wants us to serve him for it. That's what we have today. I'm going to ask the praise team to come on up here. As we get ready to sing this next song, man, I'm telling you, this is going to be a song that I want you and I want you at home to to just focus on the things that God has done for you and what he's done for me. And if you're here today and you say, look, pastor, I've been trusting on anything other than the name of Jesus. Can I tell you the church can't save you? Baptism can't save you. Giving can't save you. Coming to church can't save you. Going to Sunday school can't save you. It is only the name of Jesus that can save you. If you've trusted in anything other than Jesus, man, you need him today. He died for you. No one else has died for you. No one else could die for you. No one else has come back alive for you. 
and no one else could come back to life for you. You need Jesus today. But if you're here and you say, Pastor, I know I'm saved. But I've been trusting in this idea of consumerism. It's been about me. Man, my service to God has been about me, what I want, when I want, how I want. But today I want to be reminded, God, show me and remind me what you've done for me so that I can serve you. Let my sacrifice be my service. Whatever God's speaking to your heart, would you come this morning? Just surrender over to him right here, right now. With every head bowed and every eye closed, everybody at home, would you listen to this prayer? Oh, Father, speak to us today. Let your spirit move in this place today. Guide us today. Let us respond to you the way you want us to respond. In Jesus' name. I want to ask you to stand. And we're going to sing, man. I want you to sing this. I want you to listen. I want the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And then I want you to respond to only what the Spirit says. Not what I want. Only what the Spirit says. Would you listen? Oh, but give him the praise. Let's go.